sometimes you may hear some people say, I love living with these older people that are always talking about their grandchildren and showing pictures of their grandchildren. I get you. So remind me later to show you pictures of my cute great-granddaughter. <laughs> and, and, and speaking of her, um, I probably should get my glasses. I got it. Thanks. Speaking of her, uh, for the last few months, she's a little over 14 months old now, for the last few months, I've been getting pictures of her trying to walk. Okay. Well, she is walking well now. And my granddaughter or her mother is saying, yeah, and now what? Where is she going, you know, all the time? So I think what we're talking about today and learning to walk, it's a big deal. Because uh, it's something that we do every day. Uh, it's something that we're essentially in a habit of doing in our lives. And so I don't think we want to make this metaphor that Paul uses to be really complicated. I think it's, it's a simple idea that we're going to talk about today. It should be simple to understand. Now we can say that there's typically three aspects of walking. One is you have a destination. Okay? So walking implies progress going to where, from where you were to where you want to be. Secondly, it requires dedication. Uh, usually, uh, unless it's a baby, most people don't just take a few steps and quit until they get to the destination they're looking for. So there's some idea of continuing in this idea of walking. And then third, there's a component of dependence, okay? You have to put your weight down on your legs. Sometimes that's painful, and if your legs aren't working properly, you may need something like a cane or, or crutches, but there is a dependence on that in your walk. Now we'll see these three components today as we talk about the verses ahead of us. Before we look at our main verses today, which are starting with uh, Galatians 5, 16, we need to briefly consider the first 15 verses of chapter 5 in Galatians. There's an encouragement by Paul to continue steadfastly in the liberty of the gospel and to take care that we're not again brought under bondage of the ceremonial law, particularly the law of circumcision. Paul states the right use of Christian liberty is to serve one another um, in love, and that love is the fulfilling of the law, essentially. So Paul continues from verse 16. He gives a command, a simple command as he starts here. So let's pray together, and then we'll read these verses together. Father, we're so thankful that uh, we've seen songs this morning, and we're now going to look at your word more carefully, that you have not left us alone. You are leading us. You have uh, already given us your kingdom as we just live it out. In today's culture and we pray for your final kingdom to come but until then we pray that uh, that we are willing to share and to um, encourage others as we walk through this life we give you thanks for that in Jesus name Galatians 5 16 through 26 but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, riv rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the, spirit of the, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. 
And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us become, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So the overall point that I'd like to, to, to cover today is why we need to learn to walk in the Spirit. Um, but I'm going to give you five topics, you might say, as we go through these verses. So these topics are, number one, there's a command that is for every Christian. Secondly, there's a conflict that can get in the way of us following this command. There is a contrast in the consequences of our walk in the Christian life. But there is a conquest that is already decided for the Christian life. And lastly, there's a caution intended for the body of Christ when following this command. So let's start with that first point there is a command that is for every Christian I think that is stated in verse 16 I know we often don't like to think of terms of command uh, would you rather I say imperative something that's absolutely necessary or required the idea used in a command is not to think of a soldier drafted into a war that never wanted to be in and now he has to take orders from some self-promoting officer. Think more of it as a soldier that gladly volunteers for the right reasons into a war and is thankful to have a good commander to lead in what's best for him or her for the purpose of that battle. But this is not given as an option. <laughs> Sometimes we may think, well, Paul's just saying, maybe you want to do this. But for the life of a Christian, it's a very straightforward command to address a specific challenge, which we'll see in the rest of these verses through 26. Now, if he wanted to be totally blunt, he could just say it's a simple command coming from Paul, so just do it. But I think all of us would say, tell me more about the reasoning uh, behind this uh, so I'm going to try to do that by following Paul's inspired thinking, inspired thinking on that. This seems to be very difficult uh, because it is continuous. And so for us, I think it, it uh, really does uh, think of as something, I don't think I can do that all the time. And you're right, you can't. Okay, so we need to get that uh, straight first. Um, but it's not just taking this first step that counts. It is kind of being continuous in this. So that, that's also, and we talked about this this morning in Sunday school, that's also the concept of repentance, which I would define as not just saying you're sorry but for past actions or your sin, but a change of mind that God places in your heart to agree with his ways. Um, we need to exercise that same repentance in many ways every day. Every day, we need to agree with God. I, I think I mentioned before, Tony Evans said, um, God is right in all things, and if you disagree with him, you're wrong. <laughs> That's just that simple, really. It's not complicated. So as we agree with God in our lives, uh, then we learn this idea of walking uh, in the Spirit. We must walk and live in the Spirit of God. However, the command is like the command of love. It's not a legalistic burden laid on our back. It happens freely when God puts it in our hearts. Okay. If we see this promise from the Lord through Paul in this command, we're right. It is a promise that this will happen. It's not to say that we won't have any flesh involved in the future or that we will always walk this way. That would only be true of Jesus. 
in, in his law, okay? It's, he's the only one that can do that or has done that. We would like to think, if we desire to walk in the Spirit, we won't have any of these other desires of the flesh. But is that true? You can ask yourself. It doesn't seem to be. I don't think it's taught in these verses either. So let's move to this idea of the second topic. This is kind of the, the meat of it too. There's a conflict that can get in the way of us following Paul's command in verses 17 and 18. Let's look at where this conflict lies. It's between our flesh and the Holy Spirit. God has placed in us that what he has placed in us, he, as he gave us a new nature, when we first received the gospel, placed our faith in Jesus as our Lord. As I pondered a title for today's message, I couldn't help but hear the voices in the world expressed in a couple of secular songs like Walk This Way or Walk on the Wild Side. I don't want to put those thoughts in your head other than to say they're a counterverse to what the Holy Spirit speaks in our mind. That voice is for our eternal joy. That is the other voice that is for our destruction. Not necessarily in our eternal life, but it can be for our current time here on earth. It can cause much, much damage. It seems in many ways our new nature exists in the old flesh. That just seems to be a fact that Paul is telling us about. We see the corruption of the old nature that is still in many ways in the life of a Christian. That's why Paul often refers to it as our old sinful nature. The conflict between our old sinful nature and our new nature is that both choose, desire, and affect what is contrary to the other, working against each other. The desires of the sinful nature are opposed to the desires of the new nature, and the result that the believer might not do the things he wishes to do. Has that ever happened in your life? It certainly has in mine. Even so, many feel that can often be a bit of evidence that we're saved, that we have the Spirit living in us, because we feel that battle going on often. Now, a Christian is not a person who experiences no bad desires. A Christian is a person who is at war with those desires by the power of the Spirit. We see this idea in spiritual warfare. If we look at Ephesians 6, it's very clear that there is a spiritual warfare going on. However, even though the flesh remains... That's not the final word. It doesn't reign. When verse 17 says we are not free to carry out our good intention, that's not a final word. It does sound like what Paul wrote, though, in Romans 7, 15, when he said, I don't really understand myself, or I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Still, Paul ends that discussion in Romans 7.25 with thanksgiving when he says, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. The Spirit of God always leads us closer to God for the spiritual joy and comfort of our souls. Certainly true in verse 18, it says we're not under obligation of the law of Moses, but we can be thankful that God's moral law, if you want to call it that, is a picture of where the Holy Spirit is leading us toward, God's character in that sense. I think we need to be thankful for that, and the moral law of God is intended to provide freedom in, in our lives and peace with God and with others. That's what David expresses in Psalm 19, 7 through 10. Um, this is the only time I'm going to use the New Living Translation because I think it makes a good distinction there. The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. 
The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. They're more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They're sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. Does that give you a picture of what God is about in his character? I think so. For me, it does. So while there's currently war going on in our bodies, we approach it with victory, certain in the end because the one that leads us through this, the one that's leading us closer to him through this war. Now, I'll just say this. If we feel beat up that things are not going so well in that area, that's not coming from the Lord. That's coming from the enemy that will try to beat you up. That your life is not changing as much as you want it to. No. From the Lord, it's coming. Keep your faith in him. It's important to remember, we didn't become Christians by human effort. And we don't live as Christians by human effort. Ours is a dependent walk as we wait on the Lord for what he's doing in our life. Christian living is not a product of human regulation, but of divine transformation that's going on. We sometimes refer to this as sanctification. Further, if we try to lead the Christian life on our own, it actually suppresses the Holy Spirit in that. One person said, uh, the Spirit is not like a pace car in a race, okay? that you have to go faster to keep up with it. It's more like a locomotive on a train that we want to be connected to. We must connect to that strong engine that pulls us, that leads us. Now, we could talk about all the different ways that comes about, but certainly prayer, being in God's word, are ways that we, we stay connected there. We are led by the Holy Spirit, so walk by the Spirit means staying hooked up to this divine source of power. And go ever, wherever he leads, being securely united in the living Christ. Now, one man prayer, prayed today, says, so far today, I have, I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy or grumpy, even with my wife. And I'm very thankful for that. <laughs> but in a few minutes, Lord, I'm going to get out of bed. And from then on, I'm going to need your help every step of the way through the day. Can we say amen to that prayer? <laughs> okay. If we put our faith in Christ and him alone, we can be sure that our salvation is certain and the Holy Spirit living in us will never leave us. Still, that leads to my next topic, which is there's a contrast in the consequences of our walk in the Christian life that can be seen in these verses 19 through 23. I don't think I need to go through all the mentioned results of consequences of following the desires of our sinful nature other than to say they no longer represent who we are. This is not who we are any longer. We can say, though, through, though that Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins in the life of a believer, there are still consequences when we walk in our old nature in that sense. Sometimes the most obvious of those sins that Paul calls on are sexual immorality, which leads, which probably mentions adultery and essentially any kind of sex outside of a biblical marriage. Those sins lead almost certainly to terrible consequences um, if we walk in them. Not only the dev devastating effect on marriage, but and some of you will get this more than others, but sexual immorality can lead us to the loss of what had been an effective outcome of a biblical Christian ministry. Unfortunately, that, that is seen too often in that sense. When Paul wrote to the Gentiles there, many of them didn't even consider this adultery or, or uh, 
any of these sexual sins as sin. And we might say that that can still be in our culture today, in the Western culture. Uh, and I'm ashamed to say more and more. Those sins of idolatry, they will certainly lead to terrible consequences also because they interfere with the fellowship that you have with Jesus. The other sins of quarreling and jealousy, they're harmful to <coughs> others that we fellowship with every day. That's very important to Paul. That's what he's talking about here a lot in, in Galatians 5. It's a big deal that that can hurt our fellowship. Some Bible translations in verse 21 can cause a little bit of confusion. Though They say those who do those sins will not be in the kingdom of heaven. Most newer dynamic equivalent tra translations state those who live that way or practice those sins will not be there. Essentially to say they're not Christians. We see that language in 1 John 3, 9 through 10. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. I know sometimes that seems a little stark, but that's what his word says. There, the opposite of practicing sin is not perfection. It's not talking about living uh, the perfect life, but it's where our habits are. Whereas the power of the Holy Spirit's habits are broken. There's a desire to practice living as one that's right with God. That's who we are. We are right with God by the blood of Jesus that he's uh, made us. Well, let's move ahead to verse 22 to 23. This is the good stuff. Okay, we want to get to that for sure. What happens when we walk in the Holy Spirit, which is our new nature as a Christian? That's who we are. Now, we can mistakenly read verses uh, 22 and 23 of 5 as a challenge. I should be more loving. I should smile more. I really shouldn't uh, yell at people, other drivers going down the road. All of these things that, that I shouldn't do. But that's not what Paul, he's not writing a self-help manual or a to-do list to us. He's just talking about what happens in the life of a Christian walking in the Spirit. He's describing what a person looks like when he or she walks by the Spirit. While we're focused on Jesus, we will have more of this fruit in our lives. He's describing how the Holy Spirit is leading us to be more like Jesus, actually. He did walk perfect, perfectly in the Spirit. I was at a prayer breakfast probably 40 years ago uh, in Pullman, Washington, <laughs> When the speaker was Jim Irwin, some of you may recognize that name, he quoted Psalm 121, 1 and 2 when he stepped out on the moon. Um, so this, this is a, a strong message for me. Psalm 121, 1 and 2. I lift up my eyes to the hill. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and earth. That's where it comes from. Now, someone might actually say, oh, but you don't understand. I can't see how anyone could have the confidence that they can transform my life. Well, first of all, we're not talking about a therapist here. We're not, God is not our therapist in that sense. Uh, we're talking about the creator of the galaxies of the universe. How could we doubt what he says he will do in our life? That he's confident of that. Okay, so... Our confidence is not in ourselves, but it is in him that he is going to change our lives. Praise God for that. What Jim Irwin was saying, even though he was connected with NASA to help him on this walk on the moon, there's nothing like having the Holy Spirit as his helper. That helper not only leads you toward Jesus, he produces fruit in your life as you walk and learn to let him lead. 
The fruit produced in our lives by the Holy Spirit is an amazing contrast to what has come from walking in our flesh. Walking in the Spirit represents what Jesus spoke in John 15, 4 and 5. When Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is that one that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now John will go on later in one of his epistles, 1 John 2, uh, 6, verse 6, to say the same way doesn't mean the same degree. So as we look at that, it says, whoever says he abides in him, ought to walk in the same way as he walked. So again, the same way doesn't mean to the same degree that he just walked perfectly, so I've got to walk perfectly. It says the way the Holy Spirit leads, that's leading us. The same way the fruit Jesus spoke of in these, uh, well, Paul spoke of about these nine characteristics as a single fruit in verse 22 and 23. Let's look at those uh, characteristics together. We should realize these characteristics can actually occur in our lives, not just metaphorically speaking. Okay? This is not something, an image. This is not a fruit bowl that's on our living room table that uh, is really just plastic fruit that only represents what Jesus did. This is real fruit produced by the real Holy Spirit and placed in the real Christian's life. Let me just say a couple of things about each of these characteristics of the fruit. And I'll warm up, I'll tell you up front. Some of us may find ourselves thinking and doing things where we say, where's that coming from? Okay. That's not me, that's not my nature. Well, don't be alarmed. You haven't been taken over by Martians. You've just been taken over by God's Spirit that is doing this in your life. I experienced this a couple of weeks ago. i tell you about it later. We'll take time now to say, boy, why have I got this peace, you know, when something's not peaceful happening to me? It's the Holy Spirit. The characteristic of love is mentioned first. And the fruit, uh, I think, for two reasons. First of all, love is what Paul has been talking about all through this Galatians 5. So let's back up just one verse here, or a couple of verses, to Galatians 5, 13. What Paul said there. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. So as we look at that, let's, let me say a few words about some of these other characteristics as well. How about joy? Joy can be defined, these are simple, partial, certainly not complete uh, definitions, as spiritual happiness that Christians find in Jesus and his church, as well as the joy that he finds in them. Do you know that the joy of the Lord is for you, the joy that he has for you? So that's, that's a big deal. Peace is well described with the Hebrew word shalom, which is more than the absence of conflict. Some describe it's actually kind of like three parts. Number one, self-acceptance of the new creation God has made us to be. Number two, positive hope for the world. That's not easy today. That God has in his hands. And three, confidence in our own future that we don't worry about making something of ourselves, because we won't, but he will. Patience should mean bearing and enduring with each other in these present hardships that have already been mentioned, that, uh, that Al brought out with joy, slow to anger, ready to forgive others in this. Patience. Kindness is humbly going of ourselves, walking by ourselves in love and mercy to others, 
who may not be able to give us anything back. It's a way of thinking that leads to doing thoughtful things for others. Faithfulness. Our faithfulness to God means trusting him you know, and what he is doing and, and his loving for us all through all circumstances. It can also mean following his way even when our way seems easier, but following his way. Uh, again, I emphasize that that's trust in him. Goodness is a gift of God and the work of his spirit that shows itself in seeking the benefit of others. I, I can't help but think of Moses when he is uh, speaking with God and uh, he says, may I see your glory? I want to see your glory. And what does God say? Well, first, go hide in that rock over there. And then I'm going to pass my goodness by you. So that is definitely part of God's glory in that. That he gives to us, that he shares with us in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. Gentleness is one that I learned a little bit more about as I, as I looked at it, is the humble and gentle attitude that patiently is submissive in every offense while being free of any desire for revenge or retribution. In some ways, this gentleness is first exercised toward God. It also includes walking humbly with him in our new life, being thankful for every mercy that is new every day from him. Self-control, a little bit of a misnomer there. It's usually produced in us to fight the, that sinful nature that I've been talking about. And it still resides in us, each of us. But again, it's not coming from ourself, but it's exhibited in ourself from the Holy Spirit. You know, this, this ideal, are we powerless from sin? No, we're not. The Holy Spirit produces this self-control in our lives. When Paul says against such things there's no law, it's simply saying society needs no protection from what the Holy Spirit produces in believers. There's no need for, you know, something, a law to be set up, you know, don't be characterized by this. Well, as we finish, let's briefly look at two more topics in our verses today. Number four, there's a conquest that is already described for the Christian life. We praise God for those verses 24 and 25 that we're looking at. I heard someone speaking on marriage in the past weeks, and they said, even though I didn't have a clue what it meant to be married, I was, as soon as I said I do. So for those married guys, and I was very young when I was married, and I can tell you absolutely I didn't know how to really be married. But on that first January 5th, I was married. Okay. 56 years later, I'm still learning what it is to be married. And uh, this is like keeping learning about what it is to be in Christ. Okay. We still learn more and more. Growing in grace. Um, I like that topic that's on our bulletin today. Now in marriage, we do have some regulations, you might say. But they're not to create love, but to protect the love. It takes while to get that down, but we're still married. We're still, as we're still in Christ along the way as we're, as we're learning to walk. Those who belong to the Lord have already rejected or crucified sin when they said, I do, as being part of the bride of Christ. We have crucified sin, even though we might not fully understand what it means. It, it doesn't seem to say of a total death of that in our sin nature, but it's something that happened in the past that was accomplished by Christ, but it means that today we no longer have this uncontrollable power over our lives of sin. So it's something we have to, to realize. Paul is saying that in the Christian life, crucifixion must have taken place. And that's not just Jesus' crucifixion, but at the same time, our sinful nature was crucified in that. And we see that in Romans 6, 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. That reminds me of a time when my youngest son, and I had to ask 
my wife Pat, uh, all of the circumstances here. I, I thought it was a cat, but it was it turned out to be a dog, a puppy. He had a puppy that died, and we tried to give it a nice burial in the backyard. The only problem was he kept digging it back up. Yeah. So if you can kind of picture that, but his his comment was, "It's never going to get better if I don't, you know, dig it up." Well, it wasn't going to get better. So that's the old sin nature that we want to leave, <laughs> leave, leave in the grave there for sure. However we explain it, the clear winner of this spiritual war that we've been talking about is the Holy Spirit. The decisive battle has been fought and won by him. Jesus died for our sins and was resurrected to give us that free gift of eternal life. That's what we call the good news, right? That's what we can share with others. Now, Others can say, well, but you still sin. Okay, well, maybe we can explain a little more. And, and I think that's a purpose of us reading through the Scripture sometimes as we try to explain this to them, that we're, we're no longer condemned. You know, we, we, uh, we are free from that. Now that we fully know that and that we should let it soak in every day, Let's live this way in humility with each other. And that takes me to this final topic, which is number five. There's a caution intended for the body of Christ by following this verse 16. For verse, six, verse 26 again says, Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. Okay, well, how can that happen? Well, we shouldn't think, I got it, I got it. Now I'm walking in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and so uh, that's why Paul ends this passage of walking in the Spirit by saying, don't be conceited about your life. This is not something you have done. This is something God has done in your life that when it happens. Uh, this can also be seen sometimes when one believer can provoke another by implying, you just need to get in line. You just need to get in step like me. You know, that provokes people. It may have you at some times. I hope none of us carry that attitude with us. But we should also not think everyone else in the body has this walk down except me, which can lead to jealousy in the family. Oh, all you guys are doing great. I'm doing poor. No, that's not what God wants to put in our heart. That was very much Paul's concern in, these, in this chapter, in this entire chapter, really. In the end, if by the Spirit you do see progress in your life, do not use that as an excuse to look down on others, including non-believers. You know, you're a sinner, I'm not, you know, we've all heard those kind of things before. That's, that's what Paul is warning us against. We are to walk in humility with gratitude for what God is doing in our life. And I think we have to say, if he said he will do it, he will do it in our lives. He will change us. Now, again, there may be some patience involved there in terms of how quickly. We may say, I want patience and I want it now. <laughs> but that's not what patience is. Teaching my daughter to ride a bike, what? 45 years ago in Pullman, Washington. I would take her to her park and I would along, run along beside her and behind her on the bike. She would say and think, look at me, I'm riding my bike all by myself. When actually I was running with her and holding her out, up to keep the bike upright. Yeah. But as far as she was concerned, hey, I'm doing this. Okay, so we need to realize there that that's what, that's where Learning to walk in the Holy Spirit is what holds us up and keeps us upright in the Spirit. And so with that, let's take a look at Philippians 2, 3, and 4. And let's take it to heart. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. I think that's the way Paul would wanted to end this in this chapter. So let's pray together.
Father, help us to realize, even if it's been 50 years ago, that we were totally helpless to do anything in our life. But you put your Holy Spirit in us when we put our trust in Jesus. And now that is something that you want us to, to live with and to, to learn to walk with, the Holy Spirit. What you see in our lives, our calling, or our, our, our times with others, is what we want to see in our lives. And we confess, we need your Holy Spirit, we need you as much today as we ever did. We cannot do this without you. We cannot walk together in humility and peace without you. But we thank, thank you that that's not what we're called to do. We are called to walk with you and your Holy Spirit to lead us. Give you thanks for that. Thanks for our time to meet together. And I pray that uh, as we go through the rest of the day, we just take joy and we have the peace and all the things that your Holy Spirit wants to produce in our lives. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.